Gui. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm pretty excited to be here. This is actually my very, very first Python meetup. Um, I've been writing Python for about four or five years. It's my first language. Um, I am not trained uh, trained computer scientist. I did not go to school. I basically, uh, I was not fully enjoying my day-to-day -day as an architect uh, my first couple of years out of school, and then I decided to make a change. Uh, started learning Python, and then, you know, four years later, um, I'm basically writing Python full-time now, so really excited. Um, uh, I'm currently at Airbnb, although I should say the work that I'm presenting here is not related anyway to the work that I'm doing there. Um, I spent my last three years at WeWork, um, which is a company that is doing a lot of building construction, building design. Um, and as you see in the presentation, the architecture and design industry is quite behind in terms of kind of leveraging technology to its full potential. So a lot of the work that I did there was trying to improve processes and, and help us design you know, spaces better and faster. Uh, so first, just kind of a, a quick uh, uh, going back in time a little bit about how buildings are built. Do, are there any architects, building architects in here? No, right? Yes. All right. So. Uh, this is a, um, a Brunelleschi's uh, Cathedral in Florence, a bu beautiful building. And the point of this is that, you know, behind every building, there's basically drawings. And drawings are the ways that architects uh, sort of get the ideas out of their head and how they explain to someone who's going to be building what this thing should look like, right? So the architect draws it, he gives it to someone, or many, many someones, and they build it out. Um, these are actually original drawings from that cathedral, which I think is from like 1500s or something. You can see he even drew out what the scaffolding was supposed to look like so they could actually build a dome that big. Um, and then, you know, something like this, uh, Salesforce Tower. Buildings like this are incredibly complex. They take a huge amount of work uh, to get them drawn and produce these drawings so that they can actually be completed. And then, uh, a simpler building, just to uh, kind of walk through the example, uh, this is the Glenstone uh, Museum. I believe it's in Maryland by uh, Thomas Pfeiffer. So this guy had this idea, right? It's, it's this museum in the middle of the woods. It's these kind of white boxes. Uh, it's quite beautiful. And he's divided the space. You know, this is uh, what we call a floor plan. Non-architects usually call it a blueprint or a map. Uh, you know, you have all these different rooms where, where different exhibits would go. So he, he goes from very, very sort of abstract representation of this space, and then you press print, and basically the robots, you know, build the entire building for you. Not at all, actually. Um, what happens is a bunch of persons, they're going to receive your drawings, and they're going to spend, you know, years and years uh, basically building that out. Maybe they'll be as good or, and creative as, as these guys. Uh, basically, you're, you're going to produce sets of drawings. You're going to spend months, if not years, producing drawings. Uh, and then someone's going to look at those drawings and they're going to try to build the buildings. And the, build, the drawings are the primary way that we use to communicate to, to the builders what this building is supposed to look like. So this is a you know, traditional architecture office. They're basically going to take uh, you know, maybe there is a single designer or a group of designers came up with the idea and they're going to start producing drawings. So this is actually a drawing set for that museum that you saw. Uh, do you have any guesses? Imagine it, this is a 24 by 36 sheet. Any guesses how many sheets a museum like that actually has? 167? Not, this is probably at the very beginning of the set. I would say a, a project like this Probably just the architecture set, drawing the buildings at different scales, maybe showing where every single outlet is, what every single wall is made out of, what every single light fixture and every single conduit is, sprinklers, everything has to be documented at different scales. So you, you go from you know, large scale, you're zooming in and you're drawing every single room in the building, all the way down to how a single light fixture will fit in the ceiling. Um, you notice we're already on sheet 662, 
and this is just architecture. We also have mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, fire protection, structural. It can be, it can be in the thousands and many, many thousands of drones. Uh, a building like this that's not orthogonal can get very, very difficult to build. Oftentimes, it requires special consultants to figure out how to represent these very complex shapes in buildings and how to send fabrication instruction to machines if you are using robots or something. Uh, and then, you know, something like this. This is the Walt Disney uh, Concert Hall in Los Angeles uh, by Frank Gehry. You may, not, may or may not have heard. Uh, they, they developed really breakthrough technology to be able to build very complex uh, uh, buildings to a point where they actually spun off into their own company advising or consulting to architects how to build very complicated buildings. Uh, now we're going to kind of come down back to earth a little bit um, and talk about how most of the architects build that are building kind of traditional buildings. I would consider this somewhat of a traditional building. They're usually using traditional desktop applications. I think in the United States, I would say probably 90 plus percent of architects would use Revit or AutoCAD, which are desktop applications by um, Autodesk, and basically looks something like this. It's a very, very bulky desktop application. I think the installation file is like four gigabytes or something. Uh, there are many, many buttons. It takes sometimes years for someone to actually become very proficient at this. Uh, but what happens is, even if you are very good, generating drawings for a large build and documenting every single thing in a building, it's very time consuming. So you, the process would be something like you start modeling the building in 3D, and then you start slicing the building in every possible way at all kinds of scales and start producing drawings at different scales for the builders. And this is a very time consuming pro uh, process and it's very manual and it wastes a lot of time. You know, it would be much better if architects can actually be designing buildings instead of producing 2,000 page contracts essentially for how to build a building. Uh, so we automate it, or we try to. Uh, some, for some things, it's easier than others. So um, Revit luckily exposes through an API. You can actually automate quite a few things. So instead of you know clicking the button wall, oops, instead of clicking the button wall and then clicking two points to draw a wall, you can actually you know write a function and tell Revit to build a wall and pass the the positions. So this is actually how I got started into Python. Um, there is this really amazing project called PyRevit. Uh, Revit, by default, only accepts add-ins written in C-sharp. It's a .NET uh, SDK. So this guy, who is now a very good friend of mine, Essan, he's based in Portland, developed this amazing project called PyRevit that allows you to dump your, your um, Python scripts on these folders organized in, in kind of a pre-agreed way. And what it does is it automatically creates buttons on Revit's interface that are ready to go. And you press that button, and you can actually execute. Uh, the only caveat there is that you're actually executing Iron Python and not traditional C Python. So there's quite a few limitations in terms of using uh, libraries and packages, but definitely a, a, a nice first step. So I did that for a couple of years. I developed quite a few add-ins at WeWork to try to automate tasks. Some of them extremely exciting like this. This is one of my first tools. It basically centers the number in the room. Just wait for it. There we go, see? Um, this tool I think was used like 10,000 times or something. Uh, it, you know, imagine a giant building with hundreds of rooms and you have to manually center each tag. You don't want to do that, so. Um, yeah, lots of tools like that. The script for, for a tool like that, can you guys read it? Good. Um, we don't, we're not actually going to go through the code, but, but you can see it's very simple. The API, it's reasonably easy to use. Uh, we, you know, we get all the tags, we get their location, we get the center point of the rooms that they're in, we calculate the delta, and then we move the, the tags by that delta. Uh, this and a couple other scripts that I wrote are in this repo. Uh, if, you, if you look me up on GitHub and Twitter, you can see all of these projects. Um, this is another one. We were uh, trying to prefabricate all the pantry or kitchen modules that we work. 
so we had uh, developed some tools. Uh, this was done by a friend of mine, Jared Friedman, to basically uh, allow you to select the materials that you wanted and then automatically apply the materials to all the kitchen components uh, and that would generate drawings to go to the person who would fabricate it. This is completely written in Python as well. Um, this is a, a script that was written by a friend of mine, Jared Friedman, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Brian Lee. Uh, it's actually documented on this, on this article that talks a lot about the, wor the work that WeWork was doing in terms of research and architecture uh, uh, technology. Uh, this would basically take a building and then you would indicate where you would want your walls and the script would actually figure out all the individual columns and posts that take to create those uh, glass partitions if you've been at WeWork, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and then you can also develop tools to augment or go sort of beyond what an architect would be able to do. So this is a tool that was developed by a couple of people at WeWork. The, the primary engineer, his name is Carl Anderson, he's a data scientist. He basically developed an API in which you could provide the boundary of a room and it would tell you where to place the desks to kind of fill up that room in the most optimal way. And then along with a couple other uh, friends, uh, we basically developed the, the UI in which you could move around walls and the API would automatically calculate or uh, done through basically brute forcing where the desks should be placed. Um, the, the article, uh, maybe there's a way I can share the presentation so that the links can actually be accessed, but there's actually a publication that explains how the algorithm works behind the scenes. And then, you know, tools to build tools. Uh, a lot of the work that I did, as I mentioned earlier, was in Iron Python. If you haven't used Iron Python, it's a little bit painful because you're stuck in Python, you know, 2.7. You can't pip install anything. Um, but there's a lot of advantages. One of them is that if you like a .NET library, you can actually just import and use it. So it opens up a whole other universe of things you can do. Uh, if you're developing on Windows, you can use WPF. Uh, to you know, create uh, UIs uh, very, very easily. This is an example that I pulled up. Uh, you can basically just create windows and UI components uh, almost seamlessly. Uh, one of the projects I worked on, uh, as I started working in Iron Python, it pained me a little bit that once I started interacting with elements, I was actually interacting with C Sharp classes that behaved very differently than how I was used to write in Python. So everything was uh, Pascal case or camel case instead of snake case. There's these weird things like out and refs and uh, strong boxes, all these things I wasn't used to. So I wrote this library called Revit Python Wrapper that would basically take these C sharp objects and wrap them into a Python construct that would let me use them in you know slightly more kind of intuitive way. So. Uh, for example, every time you want to modify a object in Revit, you have to open a transaction. If you're using Iron Python, you would have to import, you know, common language runtime, add the Revit API DLL, import the namespaces, do all these things, start a transaction object, start a transaction, try to do something, and then it fails, you have to roll back, and it's, it's quite a bit of code just to do one simple thing. So, the wrapper that I wrote leveraged uh, Python's um, context manager, so you could just say with transaction, do something, and if anything fails, uh, the the wrapper would handle uh, rolling back a transaction. It would automatically initiate the transaction when you enter the context manager. So uh, this entire uh, library, Revit Python wrapper, there's basically about a couple dozen of these classes that just made it a little more enjoyable to write uh, Iron Python code. And then the last uh, part, uh, sharing and documentation. So I started writing uh, Revit API code about three and a half, four years ago. And as you can see, it's, it's basically trending up. We're building buildings that are more complex. Uh, there are more people that are learning how to code that are trying to get better at uh, automating all these desktop applications. So it's, it's, it's trending up, it's becoming more accessible. Now, when I tried to do this three years ago, the entire Revit API documentation lived in one of these. Have you guys seen these? Windows, uh, I forgot what they're called. Microsoft compiled HTML help files. Uh, they are not very fun to use. The Revit API has over 35,000 individual articles. Um, 
I would much rather go to Google and search for something uh, or bookmark a page than having to open. In addition to that, each one of these is specific to one Revit version. If you are developing for Revit and you're targeting multiple versions, you have to install four or five of these and you have to verify all of them as you're developing to make sure you're compatible. So uh, I, I basically decided to try to find a way to make that accessible and I started a project. Uh, it took me about three months to develop. Uh, I found out that those CHM files can actually just be unzipped and it's just a bunch of HTML files, very dirty HTML files, I should say, uh, images, JavaScript, et cetera. So I built this project uh, about three years ago. It's called Revit API Docs, and it basically exposes all of Revit API's documentation. It turned out quite a few people wanted that as well. The project's going on three years now. It has received almost six million visitors. Uh, it's, it's used quite often. Users can actually comment on the individual articles. They can submit additional uh, code samples and snippets to, to help others. And then I am also developing a new project that's called API Docs, that it's essentially Revit API Docs, but for uh, other applications. So we can actually support other architectural desktop applications beyond Revit. Uh, in terms of what's kind of happening behind the scenes, since this is a Python meetup, I guess include a little bit more Python. Uh, API Docs is composed of three projects. There's basically a parser that is responsible for decompiling the help files, um, cleaning up the markups, extracting all the junk that we don't want to display to the user's website, as well as wrapping that up in a CLI interface that makes it really easy for me to add uh, new, new documentation. Uh, it also creates metadata for all the files uh, pulls all the static files up to uh, S3, and then also stores all the data in an Elasticsearch server. Currently, API Docs has over 750,000 uh, individual documents, so it's uh, quite a few files to manage. Um, there's a Django application that it's a really lightweight uh, a, uh, REST API. It's basically just a proxy to the Elasticsearch server, and then it also generates the sitemaps to make sure that these documents can be found. Uh, I need to make sure I generate you know, good, accurate sitemaps. Um, and generating them, it's actually uh, quite complex. Django has some tooling that helps with that. And then the front-end application, it's actually written JavaScript uh, via JS. Uh, this is kind of the, the full uh, architecture. I won't get into the details. I think I walked through most of this. But basically, we have all the data. We decompile it. Uh, we clean it up and then we push that using a sync uh, script to Elasticsearch and S3. And I'll just for a second here, I'll open up API Docs just so you can get a feel. So this is API Docs. Uh, there's Revit and four other applications. For Revit, I'm hosting from 2020 all the way to 2005. Once you click the version, you get this tree that can has 30-something you know, thousand uh, documents. And then this is the Elasticsearch uh, server that provides the autocomplete. So this is it, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, the parser, I use the library called Click. I'm sure some or many of you have used. I, I enjoy it. I, I add a Click. Uh, type interface for almost every project that I have, even for automated simple things. If you haven't used Click, it basically allows you to turn you know, a function into a command line um, kind of interface. So once you package up your project, you can basically say, you know, I want to execute this function with these two arguments, and then you can call that function by passing the arguments. It does some really nice things. You can tell it to sort of coerce that argument into a certain type. You can say, I only want to accept this if that path is a directory or if it's a file, and it will do a lot of additional validation and coercion for you. Uh, a little bit of the work that happens that's done by the parser. This is the, the index that each version has. Uh, basically comes in this very kind of messy HTML markup. I convert it into a, a nice clean JSON that can be used to render that uh, side navigation tree. The individual articles, uh, have a markup that looks like this. There's basically tons of scripts that gets loaded. Uh, 
that are part of that uh, compiled help file and a lot of things that I don't want to display. So the, the script basically uses beautiful soup to, to strip off all the stuff that we don't want. And it does some additional things like inject some CSS classes so I can style that uh, a little bit better. Um, the parser has to be customized. Each desktop application generates slightly different help files. So there's basically a kind of a base parser that does all of the, all of the, the work that is common across all versions. And then that parser can be inherited and then each version can tweak sort of which additional HTML tags have to be stripped or cleaned up, et cetera. Uh, and then lastly, kind of going back to what I was saying at the beginning, the industry is quite behind. Uh, a lot of the work that's done, it's very, um, a little bit like just trying to automate things, sort of a faster horse as opposed to reinvent how we do things completely. Um, I think there's there's a long way to go and there's a lot of things we could do to improve. I'm personally very connected to the to all of the kind of startups and, and, and people that are trying to disrupt the industry by doing things in a very different way. Um, this is a project I help uh, maintain and curate called AC Startups. Uh, basically keeps a list of companies that I think are trying to challenge how we design or how we build, uh, you know, trying to come up with ways to improve the industry. Um, so, you know, if, if you know anyone, I know Mahmoud knows, some, uh, knows an engineer that is it's interested in the industry, but a lot of these companies are hiring. So uh, if you're interested in other domains or, you know, being an engineer in a domain that you're not familiar with, there's quite a few companies that are hiring here. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. All right. Let's see. Guy, do you want to field questions while Chris gets set up for a second? Sure. Any questions for Guy? I have one. Well, a couple. One at a time, please. <laughs> Uh, what do you what do you think of all the concrete in this room here? Architect's dream. Uh, the acoustics not very good, right? It's a lot of echo, <laughs> reverberation. I I definitely think acoustics should get more attention. Personally, uh, <laughs> being a resident of a multi-unit uh, residence. So, anyways, uh, I was I was wondering, like, how many how many pages do you think the architecture document for this building is? Um. A wild guess, I would say, if include, maybe I would say like just architecture, probably between 800 and 1500, something like that. Mm. Big sheets, like 30 by 42. Keeping the paper industry in business, very good. Yeah, uh, yeah nice. I mean, one thing, one thing I think about as you show these things is sort of like, why, why isn't Revit doing this themselves, right? You're, you're like skinning and publishing their documents for them. You know, you're doing a huge favor to all the architects out there, right? But uh, like, yeah, what, what is that play that makes them so far behind? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's a good question. I, I don't know the answer. Um, it's kind of funny because a lot of people that use the website think it's maintained by Autodesk. And when I don't release a new version, they go on the Autodesk forum and they complain. And then Autodesk emails me and asks me when I'm going to publish the new version. <laughs> you, should, you should really be getting paid for this stuff. <laughs> they should really cut you in. I see you have some ads at least. At least you got some ads. Um, yeah, no, I think you're doing great work. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming by. Everybody, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Gabe.